Hello and welcome to another IBM Developer Meetup for Australia and New Zealand. Thanks for geeking out with us. Be sure to like and subscribe to get the latest updates, news, events and more. Cool. All right. So, uh, as they said, my name's Fred Hughes. I'm one of our garage architects uh, in the Melbourne garage. I, but I'm actually based in Sydney. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what the ambassador program is in a minute. Uh, but I'll just let Junyu quickly introduce yourself. He's coming back on. Uh, getting back on the stage. Yeah, so I'm a quantum developer advocate. I'm based in Singapore. I work for the Kiskit community team. I organize uh, hackathons or workshops or talks about quantum computing and the software development kit we develop in IBM Quantum called Kiskit. So okay. later on, after Greg's uh, presentation about a general concept of quantum computing and what we do, in the second part, I will talk about uh, more hands-on uh, workshop about how to use the how to build a first quantum circuit, both using the IBM quantum experience as well as using the code and case case. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Shunji. Okay. So the the IBM sort of started this this quantum Q ambassador program as a way to, I guess, a little bit keep control of the conversation uh, around quantum and and where it's really at. So to, to be a bit realistic about. Uh, where it is and where it's going. So, you know, speaking of my background, you know, a lot I went to uni to do physics, so I managed to get into the program because I do have a physics background. But full disclosure, that was a long time ago. So, what I can do, I know enough of this stuff to be dangerous. Uh, we'll take any questions you want as we go along. But you know, be warned, there's only to a certain depth I can go. And what we generally do, the role is we go up to clients, sort of get them interested within what quantum computing is. And then if they want to go to that next step, we we put them off to our one of our Q hubs or, or in Melbourne, we've got a couple of researchers uh, in our research centre down in Melbourne who we usually hand off to who can then go into those deeper conversations. So... The, the other thing that's tightly controlled is what we're actually allowed to present. So I they give me this deck, which is 150-something slides, and we basically choose what we want to talk about because obviously they're not going to get through 150 slides in a general hour, let alone 45 minutes here. So what I've done for tonight is I, th I wanted to look more at the what the actual quantum mechanical part of quantum computing is. So a bit more in depth around, you know, that that real sort of, without going too much into the maths, although you will see some, you know, what is it about quantum that's allowing us to do this quantum computing thing? Um, I have picked slides, so I'm not doing 150 slides, but I have picked a few as we go along from each of the sections, just ones that I think uh, add some value and, and Put a bit more context around what we're doing. But I said we will certainly spend most of our time in that basics of quantum computing. Um, I don't know, Steve, how this will work, but if there's questions, uh, I don't know if people can speak or whether they go into the chat and you'll let me know, but uh, absolutely happy to take questions as we go through. I'll leave it up to you guys. All right, so what is the, the future of computing? I've left one slide in here, and, and this is... I think one of the the most important things in, is that people early on were getting the impression that quantum computers were going to take over. And we'll talk about it later, but you'll hear the phrase quantum supremacy, which sort of gives a connotation of, you know, quantum's going to come in, take over, and, and everything else goes away. But it's just not reality, right? There, there are things, we'll talk a little bit, that uh, classical computers do really well that quantum could never do. And there are some things we think quantum can do that classical computers take will take 10,000 years to compute, All right? And then you've got this third stream bonds and, you know, we've, there's a few chips around there and that. And basically what we're saying is that 
Computing in the future will be a combination of all three of these. My personal view is you won't even know what necessarily what you're using. All right, so, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the Kiskit section, where, you know, a developer, in my mind, won't necessarily go and create quantum code. They'll call an API that the fact it happens to go to a quantum machine to compute the shortest route, it will be irrelevant to the developer. They just get the answer. All right, so why do we need quantum? So what we've got here on the right, and I don't know if you see my cursor, uh, is the chemical formula for caffeine. Now, if you look at it, it's a relatively simple molecule, um, but we can't, on our most powerful supercomputer today, we can't model, fully model caffeine even. Right, and by fully model it, we're talking about the interactions of every proton, electron, and neutron to every other proton, electron, and neutron within the molecule. All right, it's just on, and on the next slide, you'll see how many bits we estimated to take. But using a qubit, and again, we'll, we'll talk about qubits later, um, we think we can model that in 160 qubits, right, which is imminently doable. We're not there yet, but we're certainly on the way. So if you just looking at sort of this in this chemistry realm, right, if you say caffeine sort of a, a relatively, you know, low complexity molecule, if you look at something like penicillin, which, you know, would be fantastic to be able to model uh, penicillin and, and have targeted personal targeted antibiotics and things like that. To be able to do that, it's estimated you would need 10 to the 86 bits. Now, I've got a slide later on, but that is essentially more atoms than there are in the foreseeable universe, in the foreseeable universe, the observable universe, sorry. Yet we think we can model that in 286 qubits. All right, so one of the one of the things that's it's Key to remember here though, because you know, for example, we say ethanol, if you look at 42 qubits, we've got 42 qubit machines now. So can we model ethanol? Yes. Are there now enough qubits to do anything with it? No. So we are getting there. And there's a lot of work going on in this area. But that's sort of the sort of bit of the background of why we need a different approach to computing to be able to do this stuff. So a few, and these are new slides, and there's no, we didn't get any real explanation behind them. So I can't, if you ask me exactly what we're doing in this area, I can't tell you. But basically, these are the some of the areas we're currently looking at with some of our partners. So um, a lot of stuff happening within chemical innovation. You know, in this one, is like, you know, modelling it to, to find more efficient lithium batteries, for example. All right, some of the other things, and this is one I do, I, I know it's been going for a little while. We've been working with a uh, finance institution in the US around simulating derivative pricing. So, you know, if you can make a, a, a call milliseconds earlier than somebody else, you know, there, there's a percentage points of profit to be made, I guess. Some of the other areas are around of routing and optimization. Um, so it, it costs a lot of money to create a, a car in this case and test it. So that's why we simulate. But there's only so much you can simulate down to a certain level and then you're into approximation. So what the thought is that, you know, with quantum computing, we'll be able to simulate exact it's a bit like the molecules the, the chemical example where today we do we already do it but we model down and we get an approximation of, of energy levels within the molecule whereas with the quantum we we can get exact modeling into exact sort of energy levels and it's sort of similar here so we can do these things today but we'll be able to do them better with quantum is the expectation uh, one of my favourites, you know, the travelling salesman problem. How do you how do you get around to every every destination, you know, within the shortest period? Again, there are solutions today to do that, but they're there's they're not exact. So I think 
unless it's changed, you know, it used to be that we could come up with a solution that is guaranteed to be no more than 20% worse than the optimal solution. Whereas with quantum, the expectation is we can get the optimal solution and it doesn't take 10,000 years to calculate it. All right, um, AI machine learning is another big area we're looking at. I actually did a course through Toronto, Univer Toronto Uni last year, I think it was early last year, and it was the first time they'd run a machine, quantum machine learning. Um, and probably the hardest thing I have done in a long, long time. It was, it was incredibly difficult with the maths and there's, there's still a lot of trial and error going on. So it, it absolutely showed that there's applicability and, you know, it, it's very much warrants further investigation. But I've got to tell you, man, it was, it was hard. I had one of my the other um, advocates who actually has his PhD in theoretical physics. Uh, every now and again, I'd have to get him to come to the whiteboard and just check my maths. And, you know, there was more than one day we spent two hours doing quantum Fourier transforms and stuff that you just don't want to know about. It was hard. All right, so here, uh, yeah, this is just a slide showing some of the, the other areas that are being investigated or where we think that there are potential use cases. So a, a lot of this, I guess we're not trying to keep it, you know, realistic. We're not saying that quantum computing will absolutely revolutionise all these areas. Is that enough work and sort of research done to go it looks interesting and certainly worth investigating more and and that's really where where quantum's at at the moment is it, it has shown that it, it, it's worth basically looking deeper into it and i'll talk a little bit about you know there's the for me there are two things that need to happen around there's a it's an engineering problem and it's a, a computer science problem but i'll come to that a little later all right, so that's sort of the background to it. Now, quickly, where are we today? Um, we, you would have heard the term quantum supremacy, which is what you, a lot of other people calling it and what you see in the newspapers. IBM doesn't like the term quantum supremacy because it has a connotation, as I said earlier, that at some point quantum will take over and everything else will go away. And that's just not the case. So we've been using this term called quantum advantage. Right, which it's it's it essentially means the same thing, but what we're saying is that there will be some things where quantum will be faster than classical, and there will be some things where classical can do that quantum just can't. So, from about 2016 uh, was when we first launched our IBM Q on the cloud, where you could get in and actually you know run code on the quantum computer so that was sort of the first real where where quantum picked back up again and you know there a lot of interest came into it but at that stage we were looking very much to the end game and saying you know once we have you know fully functional you know universal fault tolerant quantum computers what could we do with them but a couple of years ago people started going well actually yeah, we don't have that yet, but what we've got now, we could actually maybe still get some value out of. And and they they came up with this term called NISC, which is a noisy intermediate scale quantum. So what you'll, we'll, I think we'll talk about a little bit later on, is that the, the enemy of quantum is noise within the system. Um, and today, the systems are very noisy. So... That means your, your coherence time and things like that are quite short. So the, we've still been able to prove that, you know, even at this sort of noisy, you know, intermediate, small scale uh, with short circuit depths, there are still areas where there's lot where there's value where we can do things that a classical can't. So we're sort of in that phase now where a lot of that development's going on. You know, we're still pushing towards obviously the fully fault tolerant, but 
we're saying, you know, there's it's here it is. It's out there. Get in, have a play with it. Um, researchers are in there. You know, the, the more people playing with it, the more, the quicker we get to somewhere. So where do we think? So that's sort of 2016 to now. So where, when do we think we're going to get to quantum advantage? The real answer is nobody knows, right? People will come and tell you it's five years or whatever. It's, they're just guessing, right? So the, the Nirvana is a fault tolerant, you know, fully fault tolerant universal system. Um, and it's estimated that to do that, for having to have one qubit that's fault tolerant, the estimate is something like a thousand to you'll need a thousand to ten thousand physical qubits for one to to create one fault tolerant fault tolerant qubit, and then you need a million qubits to do something. So you know the numbers we're talking about are you need like a hundred million qubits to get to this nirvana of a fully fault tolerant system. Uh, where are we today? Yeah, at fifty. All right, so that's not to say we won't get to 100 million, but you know, unless some uh, somebody comes up with some drastically different approach to what's happening today, it's not going to be next week. All right, it could be five years, could be 10 years. You know, when one of the slides I took out talks about uh, breaking encryption and uh, using, I think it's Shaw's algorithm, right? Which they say, you know, you see in the newspapers, it talks about, yeah, it's going to break the internet. To be able to do that, you know, we're, our estimate is 10 to 15 years and we're working, uh, the security guys have already come up with ways to make security quantum safe anyway. So, you know, it is coming and it is there, but it's going to be down the track sometime. So one of the, the when, you, when you read articles, they, they equate the power of a quantum computer to the number of qubits and, and say that's it. Right, the more qubits you got, must be more powerful. IBM is saying it, it's more than just the number of qubits. There are many factors that that make up, you know, this sort of power of a quantum computer. Um, yeah, you can see in here, but you know, you look at some of them, like co coherence, coherence is the amount of time a qubit can remain stable for. So if you put it into a state, how long will it stay in that state before it just naturally decays to something else? And that's, I think, nanoseconds or milliseconds at the moment, right? So, and that needs to be significantly longer before you can do deep circuit depths. And we'll talk about circuits in a little while where you have the, the number of gates that you have in a, in a circuit you know, if, if you can only hold the coherence for, let's say, one second and your gate takes, you know, half a second to, to change state, then you can only run two gates. So if I've got a lot of high coherence but a low, you know, sort of gate fidelity, then is that better or not? So you can't just take coherence either. So it's all these things that come together that really go into what, what we're calling quantum volume. Right. Oh, it's a build slide. Uh, oh, so this is an example. So this is sort of a topology when we, we talk a little bit about the chips later. So these are the qubits and basically, you know, again, the Nirvana would be every qubit is connected to every other qubit, but that's physically hard to do in 3D space uh, with the connections. So depending on you know, the topology of the chip, also affects that volume. So, oh, in there, software. All right. So, as as an example, what this is saying. All right. If you look around, one axis is like the number of qubits, and the other axis is the error rates. All those qubits. So, if you're down here in the, or I guess I'd call that the bottom left corner, um, with you know not many qubits and a high error rate, and one like a one percent error rate. If I increase the number of qubits to fifty. Have I, without increasing the the error rates on the qubits, or decreasing, I should say, not increasing, um, have I actually gotten any more value? So if I've got a 1% error rate and I've got 50 qubits, so I'm now at 50% errors across those. Doesn't really necessarily seem like we're getting much value out of it. 
And similarly, if I make much better qubits and decrease the error rate, but I don't increase the qubits, well, I can't do much more of that either. So, you know, you sort of need to to increase these things together. And that's all goes into and the, and the other side going into making the this quantum volume number. All right. So the meat of what we're doing. Um, I love this quote. Because when you get into quantum, you you quickly realise that if you try to think about quantum mechanics and quantum computing the same way you think about classical computing, you'll quickly get nowhere. All right, it is quantum mechanics for those who haven't done it is you know it's almost counterintuitive. Um, I was watching a lecture, I think it was MIT or Stanford, I can't remember now. And um, it was, I like the way that the lecturer was introducing it. So his example was, you know, if I've got some machine that I fire a particle into, and if it comes out one side, it's red. If it comes out the other side, it's blue. So 100% of the time, if it comes out the red side, it'll be red. Now, if I've got a second machine that says, uh, I don't know, changes the shape, circles and squares. So if I fire a particle into there, and out of the circle side, 100% of the time will come out of the circle. Now, if I fire, if I if I put those together and I fire a particle in, it comes out red. I know it's red. 100% of the time, it will be red, and that goes into the shape machine and comes out a circle. What percentage of time will that be a red circle versus a blue circle? And you go, well, obviously it's a red circle because only red ones went in. But and and this is quantum mechanics, is we actually could come out as a blue circle, even though only red ones went in. So it, it, quantum mechanics is very counterintuitive and you have to you have to leave your classical thinking at the door, as they say. All right, so what I want to do here now is give you a bit of an overview of sort of the, the, the essential quantum mechanical ideas that are going into to create quantum computing. All right, so there's five basic ideas we're going to talk about. Um, I'll talk about this uh, quickly now, just as a, as a teaser. So basically, in a classical machine, you know, you've got a bit, it's either one or zero, and you can represent it on basically, yeah, a one-dimensional line. It's either one or zero. In qubits, when we get into it, you can actually have, you know, multiple states so what they do is they represent it as a vector in a unit sphere, and this thing is called a block sphere. So imagine this, when we talk about it, you, you imagine it's a vector and it's, as you manipulate the qubit, this sort of vector is going at different angles around that sphere. All right, so superposition. So before getting to exactly what that is, just a little bit of maths and, and uh, nomenclature. So basically, we have this thing called a ket, which is this notation with the you know the the line zero and a bracket. That's a zero ket or ket zero, which indicates uh, a zero classically. And similarly, this is the one ket, uh, which represents a one. Right. So this is in two dimensional space, and it's complex numbers for those who care. And a lot of this stuff is then represented as a matrix matrices. So what we're saying then is that we can actually write this vector in a notation that says we have some you know, coefficient, some amplitude is zero plus some amplitude is one will we'll give you the direction of that vector, All right? So what that means is that I can actually represent a qubit as being a combination of both zero and one at the same time, All right? And you know, just for the for the mathematicians, this is the you know the uh, probability amplitude. If I want the actual probability, you know, take the square of the of the absolute value. If you add those together and they equal one, now you've got a probability. So. What we're saying is essentially, you know, this is 20% chance of being zero and an 80% chance of being one. So if you look at that on the block sphere, 
you know, that might be, if it's an 80% chance of being one, that might be a vector that points, oh, I've lost my mouse, down here somewhere. So what superposition actually means is that I'm, I'm neither in that zero or one state. I'm in, a, I'm in some sort of combination of it. If you think about it as uh, flipping a coin, if I've got the coin in my hand, I can see it's either heads or tails. But if I flip it, while it's in the air, is it heads or is it tails? Is it both or is it neither? Right. So superposition is sort of that that sort of concept of while the coin's in the air, it's actually in both states. Now, by manipulating these amplitude probability amplitudes, I can I can nudge it when it does come down to is it more likely to come out down as zero or is it more likely to come down as one? And that's basically what this representation on the block sphere is. So if I put it in perfect superposition, I've actually got the vector on the on the equator of this sphere, which says, well, 50% of the time it'll come up as zero, 50% of the time it'll come up as one. I can manipulate that a little bit. So maybe, you know, maybe I can move it up closer to zero, which means when we measure it, it's more likely to come up as zero. But what it also means is if you think about uh, AM radio where we encode, you know, the, encode the sound into the amplitude of the signal, what we can actually be doing is encoding information into the amplitudes of these coefficients. So I can, I can, you know, basically say if I need, and, and this is where it's hard to describe, if, if you need it to be more likely to be a one, then what manipulations can I do to the qubit? to make it more likely to come up. But basically the idea of superposition is it's in both states at the same time. And depending on how you, the, these amplitudes you're influencing, which one's more likely to come up. So on that, so how do you then actually know, how, how is that useful if it's in both at the same time? So the answer is at some point you need to measure the qubit and it's called you know, collapsing, collapsing the state. So basically what you're saying is at a point in time, you go to the qubit, are you zero or are you one? And it has no choice except for to give you a zero or one. Can't go, well, 50-50. It can only go zero or one. Um, so from a mathematical perspective, you see, you know, this is this is basically saying there's a 50% chance of zero plus a 50% chance of one, and that gives me the, that's that's describing that vector or the state that the qubit's in. Um, again, it's you know, three-dimensional complex uh, states, so you know you can have minus i in there. Um, so that's basically measure. The thing you remember about measurement is when I tell it to collapse the state and give me an answer, it has to give me an answer, and it has to be zero or one. While I've not asked it, it can be in whatever state it likes. And um, I think Junji will demonstrate that in when he talks about Kiskit later. You'll see um, that happening. All right, so entanglement. Steve loves the word entanglement, and he's, none of his jokes are any good so far, but I'm sure he'll get to a good one at some point, or maybe he won't. That's one of his jokes. Um, so entanglement's a, a, an even tougher one to describe, and... We, it, we understand what it is, but we don't understand how it works at this stage. So basically what we're saying is if in, a, in the quantum world, if you entangle two, two quantum objects and you move them apart, if I measure one of those, I intrinsically, without a doubt, know the state of the other one, no matter how far apart they are. And this was, there was an actual physical experiment done where they did this and they proved that the transition, so once they measured one, they could prove the other one knew what state it needed to be in faster than the speed of light, which means there can't be some other particle that's emitted out of one to tell the other one, other state what it should be in. Um, I don't mind too much that I can't explain it because Einstein called it spooky stuff at a distance. So I always look at it. if he didn't understand it, then I'm quite within my rights to not understand it either. So basically what we're saying is in a classical sense, if I've got two bits 
and I measure one of those bits, it's a zero or one, that has no effect on the other bit, right? So if I measure one zero and one, I could measure the other one, and it could also be a zero or one. If the first one changed, the second one could stay the same, right? So you can describe the system as two independent bits. In an entangled state, you can't describe the, the system separately. It can only be described as a system. So if, the if I measure the first qubit, I absolutely know what the second qubit is. So if you look at this, ignore sort of the maths around it. But what this is saying is that the in an entangled state, if the first qubit is a zero, then I know the second qubit is a zero. All right. If you change the first qubit to a one, then the second qubit also has to be a one. All right. This is saying the same thing, but the other way around. Saying if the first qubit's a zero, then the second qubit's a one. If the first is a one, then the second is zero. But it's the same thing. They're the only two states it can be in. Whereas if it's not entangled, then if you look in this one, the first qubit stays at zero, but the second qubit changed to one. So that's a non-entangled state. So that's where you can describe them as separate, uh, separate states. All right, so what's the next? Oh, we talk a little bit more. Oh, this just goes a bit more into the same thing. Um, yeah, if you're interested in the maths, I'm sure myself or Junior can, can have a chat to you about it. But, you know, this particular state is a special state called the Bell state, which I think Juni has an example of in his demo. Um, the only other interesting thing from a, from a quantum chip perspective is you can only entangle qubits that are connected. So if you have a look, if this qubit in the middle is not connected to, uh, it's a bit hard to see in here. It's sort of not, well, actually, they're all connected. That's a bad example. But if you remember back to the topology one I showed before, you know, if, if the two qubits don't have a physical connection in there, you can't entangle them. And that's that comes back to that ability to for the quantum volume. All right. So just as in classical computers, you have gates, you know, and, NAND, ZOR, all those sorts of things. In quantum computing, you also have gates. Um, you won't find any of the same gates that you find in a classical computer. Um, but the the most, well, I, don't know, I wouldn't say most important, but a, a key part of a quantum gate is that it's reversible. So if you use this example, so this H, big blue H, is a Hadamard gate, which is what puts a qubit into superposition, so that 50-50 state. So all qubits are initialized as zero, right? So I put it in the superposition. If I measure it, I force it to pick one, so it will come out as either zero or one. Now, if I do the same thing here, if I put it into superposition, I collapse the state by measuring it, it's picked a zero or one, and then I put that back into superposition again, and then measure it again, I'm still going to get a zero or a one because I've collapsed the state and essentially reset the qubit in essence. But if I run it through a Hadamard gate, and then I run it through another one before I measure it. So this is essentially, think of this is almost like taking a random number and timesing it by another random number. In a classical computer, you get a, a really random number, I guess. But in quantum, if I do a Hadamard gate followed by another Hadamard gate, measure it, I will get back to where I started because these gates are reversible. So that, that's a key point of quantum gates. Um, when I talked a little bit before about circuit depth, so, you know, lots of stuff go into it, like the, the decoherence time, but basically what we're talking about is how many operations can I do in, in, a, in one go before the system's lost coherence. So if I've got long, short decoherence and really fast gates, I might get six gates in. I've got long decoherence and really fast gates, I might get 100. And that, that's where a lot of research is going into at the moment. All right, so the last concept we want to talk about is interference. Um, I'm sure many of you who, who ever did science at school probably did the two-slit experiment where you, you know, put a wave through a couple of slits and you see the interference pattern that, that appears on the wall behind it. So the same sort of concept is used in quantum computing. 
So what, what this is describing is basically a three qubit system. And these are the eight states that it could be in. Now, if I just do three qubits in superposition and then measure each qubit, I'm going to get roughly an equal probability of every state. There will be some discrepancies because of noise within the system, but basically, you know, it's going to be, if there was two qubits, it'd be one qubit would be 50-50, right? It might be 49.9 .9 and 51.1, something like that, but it's going to be roughly equal. So the idea of interference is using the gates, and if I change that prob, what can I do to a qubit to change that probability into amplitude? So, and there was something, so, yeah, and generally you will go through the gates, but, you know, if I put it in superposition, can I, can I rotate, if you imagine that block sphere, can I rotate the vector anywhere? Can I change the phase of it? So I can encode all of this information into the qubit using, by, by manipulating it through gates to change those probability amplitudes. So the idea of a, how a, a, you know, a quantum algorithm works is that I, I want to, manipulate the qubits so that I increase the probability of getting the right answer and decrease the probability of getting the wrong answer. Now, that is so much easier said than done. Um, it, it, to, I don't know how to describe it. It is when I did the machine learning, quantum machine learning, that is just, yeah, it's a difficult thing. And that's why I think, you know, the, the Craig's, sort of theory of the future is that um, there'll be two types of developers in the future, those who write quantum algorithms and those who don't even know they're using them. So, and the majority of people, people don't even realise they'll call an API and the fact that went off to a quantum computer to get the answer, they will neither know nor care. All right, so that's basically the five key things. So why how can I put more information into, into the system, right? And how, how many qubits do I need to do things? So the, the key point here is if I, uh, if I have a one qubit system, then basically I have two possible states, right? It's a zero or a one, but it's also a combination of those. So it could be anywhere in between. If I add a second qubit, now I get four states that it can be in at the same time. Now, if I had a third qubit, I've now got eight. So it's an exponential growth. When you're looking at a classical computer, if you want to double the amount of you know, the states you can store in memory, you've got double the memory. All right, so if you look at this as an exponential growth, so remember before I said the universe had something like 10 to the 84 but it's actually 10 to the 82 um, atoms in the observable universe. We will have as many states as that with only 275 qubits, All right? So that's, that's where the real power of quantum computing is coming from. It's, it's that ability, that exponential growth, the number of states, that computational space that you can use. All right, so that's that's the the physics and then the, and the core of of how quantum computers will work. Um, so I've probably got another ten minutes or so. So obviously, if there's any questions, I'm assuming Steve will butt in, um, or we can have, talk about have some questions at the end. Um, so I'll do now. There was, but um, uh, Junyi uh, answered it. So, but um, cool. thank you. That was uh, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> oh, here he is now. I'll, I'll jump. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question was about uh, whether IBM wants to. Uh, well, IBM is working with the the quantum computation application with uh, automobile industry or for the road automation. So I mentioned to them that yes, we are working with uh, Daimler on the to try to start a chemical reaction in the lithium ion battery to make more efficient battery for the electric vehicles. And cool. for the Thank route you. optimization, we work with um, Delta Airline. It's a new collaboration we have it just this year. So we started how to, like the child, uh, like the 
salesman travel program, traveling salesman yeah. program that we try to optimize the routing of airplanes using the quantum yep. computer. So I will answer cool. that. <laughs> Great. And, I, and I've got a slide in, in a couple of slides that sort of put some of the names down when we talk about our Q network. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'll good. cover a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So just some pictures of the actual quantum computer. So this is the inside of quantum computer. We call it the chandelier. Um, and it's the sort of picture you see because once you put the cover on, it's, it's not very interesting. Um, so what what are you seeing here so a majority of what goes on of all these wires and stuff do two uh, for two reasons cooling and coax cables to get signals to the qubits so you you might have heard you know they they say things like you know the quantum computer's got to be colder than outer space all right so the, the actual answer is you need to be the way IBM and a number of other companies are doing it using superconducting electrons, um, we need to basically be almost at absolute zero. So we cool down to about 15 millikelvins, which is, and you can correct me if I misquote this, only, but it, it's like minus 273 point something Celsius. So it's just off absolute zero. Where absolute zero is a point where there is no energy in the system and not even the electrons are moving. All right. So most of you can't see, or you can only just see a little bit here, but right at the actually right at the start of the the title page, there are big copper uh, look like weaved cables that look like you know they're bringing in power. They're actually the initial cooling. All right, so basically you, there's a big, big push from an external system doing the initial cooling in this sort of first chamber. And then as you go down each chamber, it's progressively cools till you get down to this minus 15 millikelvins at the bottom. Um, for those interested, it's it's a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. And when I was actually over at uh, Research Center, Watson Research Center over in the US, um, it was quite funny. We asked the guy, oh, why is it helium-3, helium-4? And he said, oh, well, actually, I've got two hours to spare. If you if you want me to take you through it, we'll go grab a whiteboard. And at that point, we went, no, no, no. We, don't, we don't care that much. Um, so it is, a, you know, just the cooling is an is a engineering feat in itself. Um, each qubit then has a coax, you know, cable to get the, because you send microwave pulses to the qubit to both measure it and change and sort of manipulate the state. Um, so, you know, all, all, most of these thinner wires are the coax coming down or I can't remember if it uses the same cable to take the reading back or if it's a second cable. But either way, that's what the majority of these sort of smaller wires are. Um, interesting on that, talking to the same guy. So he, he's the, um, the physicist that, that basically comes up with this. And I was, he was talking about, you know, we need 100 million qubits, blah, blah, blah. And I sort of went to him, huh, oh, how are you going to get that many 100 million coax cables to, to, in these things to go to the, uh, down to the chip? And he looked at me and went, 100 million? How am I going to get 1,000 to go down there? He then sort of mumbled, oh, yeah, I've got some ideas and just walked on. But the, I, you know, I, I, as I sort of mentioned, I, I think there are two basic areas of research that have to happen. One, one is a engineering problem and the other is a computer science problem. So the engineering problem, <coughs> excuse me. I can't put myself on mute. Hang on. You're right. We can <laughs> we can take I'm a dry throat talking. Oh, <laughs> I, I was going to ask if that was um, quantum coffee, but um, we'll um, oh maybe we'll um, take a small break. Are you back? No, you're right. It's good. I'm back. Okay. Yeah, okay. it wasn't a quantum coffee. It was a real one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Get it entangle extra caffeine. No, I'm going to step back. <coughs> cool. All right. Um, yeah, so I think there's this engineering problem of just 
how are we going to put all these qubits and get and get all these signals down there? And to me, the well, equally hard, maybe harder, is how are you going to build these quantum algorithms? Um, so this is a chip. You know, it sits through that right down to the bottom. And you saw that other picture. <coughs> uh, these are examples of topologies of actual, we name all our quantum machines, you know, usually after places here. Uh, the latest, our 53 qubit is Rochester. And that's sort of, I don't know how they come up with the topologies, but, you know, that's part of the experimentation that's going on now. So this I mentioned before about entanglement. So in this instance, <clears throat> qubit zero and one could be entangled, but one and four couldn't, or two and four. Um, actually, I guess two and three could be entangled. If you entangle two with one and one with three, then I guess technically entangling two and three. Uh, once you put the cover on, so this is what it looks like, you know, just more pictures of the chip. So this is what you see in the lab when you go when you go down you know, the Yorktown. There's just you know rooms full of these quantum computers, and then I think it was this early last year. <clears throat> I think it was around CS time last year. We revealed what we call the Q System One, which is basically every quantum computer, real one that you see today, is in the lab and it's controlled by the technicians in the lab. <clears throat> So what IBM wanted to do was basically to prove we could do a self-contained quantum computer. So this is, um, yeah, a one sort of box. All the electronics are in the back. It's, you can't buy one, but you think about, you know, this is like if I want to take a quantum computer home, right? This is I could go and buy one and go and plug it in. <clears throat> so we don't actually sell them. Um, and surprisingly, you know, for IBM, which for the older IBM, you know, new IBM is getting much better at this. It's actually a, a quite a spectacular design. They actually had industrial designers come in and and make it a little un IBM like. <clears throat> uh, it's it's quite you know with the steel cover and everything looks quite good. All right, so that's the hardware. Um, Junyi will go into this in much more depth. So I'll just quickly cover the Q experience. So you can get on the on the cloud now on the web and play with the quantum computers to your heart's content. Um, I said he'll go into it. The Keys Kit is our open source software stack. Uh, again, he'll explain these, but the only part I'll mention here, because in, in where I mentioned before, you know, there'll be those developers who create quantum algorithms and there'll be those that just use them. And that's what this Aqua part of the Kids Kid is, is building those uh, a library of the algorithms that you as a as a developer will just call, <clears throat> right? You want to know the shortest route around town? Just call the, give me the shortest route. Don't worry about creating algorithms to do it. <clears throat> All right, Q Network. So this is what we talked about a little bit. So. You, you know, basically, IBM created this Q network, which is uh, there's sort of different areas where we have a few hubs around the world. Melbourne University is the hub for in Australia, um, so you can become a partner. You know, either usually through the hubs, so we have industry partners. Then, a place like Melbourne Uni is the hub, and then members will work with the hubs and startups and that and that sort of thing. And they work very closely down there with our IBM research. We have a couple of researchers like Anna Fan down in research in the Melbourne labs who are doing some great work around this. Um, you see there's a you know, spattering of them all over the, around the world. Uh, you know, again, I don't want to do too much of an advertisement. I want to be more technical, but, you know, they're different. You can join, if you join the Q network, you know, that's where you're, you're, you'll get access to the the researchers and training support and can help with that sort of collaborative use cases. And, you know, the idea isn't you come to IBM and we go and solve the problem. It's you come to IBM and we'll help you solve the problem. All right. Uh, I think the next screen is the one that just names a few. So as you mentioned, there's Daimler on there. 
Um, you know, JP Morgan Chase was the one that was doing the derivatives work. Uh, there, this is not the latest slide unless somebody can see Woodside on there. So in Australia, Woodside have joined the, the Q network locally. Uh, I think they're in as an industry partner. I can't remember if they're an industry partner or a or as a member. All right. And, you know, finish off later with this, but basically the answer is you want to play with it, you can get in and do it today. All right. You can, if, you, if you just want to play around, get on the Q experience, play with some gates, you want to go a bit further using Kids Kit, and then you know, if as an organisation you want, or as a startup you want to work with IBM, then you know we put you in touch with with the guys in the labs down here, and and you can look at becoming part of the network. All right, so that's basically and right on seven thirty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. perfect. Okay. Good. So um, my name is Junya. So I'm a quantum developer advocate for the IBM Quantum and the Kiskit community team. So a little bit about my background. I was doing a PhD in the National University at uh, Experimental Low Temperature Physics. That's why you see in my profile photo, you see an image of a dilution refrigerator. So I wasn't exactly doing quantum computing, but I used the same machine that cools the things to very low temperature, close to 15 millikelvin. So that's why you see I'm using that machine. So um, so for today's presentation, I'm going to go through, first give you a, a little introduction of the different elements of Qiskit, which is our uh, Kis uh, quantum information science development kit to run programs on quantum computers. And the second part will be the demo using the IBM quantum experience, as well as in code using Qiskit, of all these concepts that Craig just covered. For example, the superposition, measurement, entanglement, and some quantum gates. And at the end, I will demonstrate using a Grover's algorithm to show you the power of quantum computer using the interference in combination of superposition, measurement, and entanglement. So this slide is a summary of the different components of Qiskit. We like to call it elements, and we use some very fancy uh, Greek name to call a different component. So you see, between the hardware and our software Qiskit, we have this element called Terra. Terra means Earth, so it is a foundation to foundational tools to help us to build quantum circuit and run quantum circuit and compile the quantum circuit to something you can actually run on actual hardware. And there's so other other components. Air means air, which is, um, I mean, air, E-E-R, or air in English, A-I-R, which is a um, special purpose um, simulators for running algorithm, because even though we have the hardware available, there's still some, it cannot be run real time. When you submit a job, you spend some few minutes to wait for it. And sometimes if you want to study algorithm, you want to have a faster iteration time. So you run the simulation to make sure everything is properly done before you submit the job. So we have a simulator that you can run on your local computer. And there's also Ignis. Ignis means fire in English. And it's a tool to characterize and mitigate the errors for our near-term quantum devices. As Greg has mentioned to you that we don't have a perfect quantum computers, so we have to, in the near term, we have a small number of qubits and the qubits are not perfect. And to squeeze the most power of these near term devices, we need to be able to understand the error present in these devices and try to mitigate them using our understanding of quantum devices. And the last part is called agua. Agua means water. It's an element of life. So it's a collection of quantum algorithms that we can use to do near-term um, applications and to study business use cases of quantum computers. For example, like Greg mentioned, the optimization problems, chemistry simulations, uh, quantum machine learning, and so on. So 
as I promised to you, the second part of this is to use the IBM, the circuit composer on IBM quantum experience to do a demo of the concept that Craig has mentioned. So if you go to quantum computing, let me show you the link maybe. So if you go to quantum desk computing.ibm.com and you register account, you go to a IBM quantum experience. And you see on the left hand side, you see a sidebar called circuit composer. A circuit composer is a visual way of showing you the circuit and you can do drag and drop to put the, these quantum gates. So this is a simple example. I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you the simple example of the how to use this circuit composer. So to start with our quantum, this is a one qubit and this is a one classical bit that we use to read the result of quantum computers. And if you don't apply anything, the state is initialized as zero. And on the left hand side, you can see a state vector, which is like, you can think of like a measurement statistics uh, of this uh, state. So if you don't do anything, you'll be zero. The amplitude of this state will be one. And if you apply X gate, X gate is just like in a classical computer, not gate. You do a flip flip, flipping zero to one. So X gate is nothing very quantum, but if you want to do a superposition, you can look for this gate, for Hadama gate. And once you put this, you see that you have a superposition of zero and one, and the amplitude is square root of two divided by two. And if you want to see the measurement probability, you see that after you're applying a harder market, you have half of the chances to see zero, half of the chances of one, because these two, it is a superposition state of zero and one. So next thing I'm going to show you how to generate uh, entanglement in this uh, circuit. So we can just change to match the classical register with quantum register. So we now doing two qubits because entanglement is a property of uh, multi qubits. So to generate a uh, entanglement, you can put this other gates and also this thing, which is called control not gate. So what this is doing is first, if you go through from zero, you go through other gates, you become zero plus one that I have show you in the previous circuit and this is a control node what it does is to if this qubit is in zero it does nothing to the qubit one but if this state is one it's going to do a b flip a not gate or a x gate to qubit one so because this is super precision you have 50 percent chance of zero 50 percent chance of one so qubit one also have 50 percent chance of not being fit or 50 percent of being fit so you see that at the end you have this i think this is better measurement probability you see that the measurement outcome we have 50 percent of both being zero and 50 percent of both being one that shows the entanglement because you see that the state of the measurement outcome of this qubit is correlated to this one Whenever this is zero, this is also zero. Whenever this is one, this is also one. So that's how we can generate entanglement between two qubits. So now we can go back to um, the slide. Is there any question at this point? That's good. Okay. So I am going to show you in a code how do we going to do it, the same thing that I've shown you before, by using a Python code. So this is an image showing a supervision, our favorite example of supervision, the shredding scat. And when you want to run Qiskit, you can run it like I'm doing now using a Jupyter notebook, and you can import the Python uh, Qiskit Python library. 
these are few uh, import statement. We need to import a quantum circuit and execute to create an executing quantum circuit. And the second line is to import some handy function to visualize the quantum state. So to create a quantum circuit is very easy. You just need to pull quantum circuit and pull a variable to specify the number of qubits in your quantum circuit. And this we can visualize how the circuit look like. Right now it's very boring because you haven't applied any quantum gates yet. So you see an empty thing. And this part is going to simulate this quantum circuit, which is empty. And you, so the, to do that, you can do the execute. So execute, you put a quantum circuit, you use this uh, simulator, which can simulate and return you the final quantum state of the circuit. And you dot result dot get state vector, you can execute a simulation and return the state. And to plot that, so I'm not using the block sphere, which introduced by uh, Greg, because uh, in Qiskit, we are using a new concept called Q-sphere that can uh, expand the concept of block sphere from one qubit to multi qubit. Block sphere is only a concept for one qubit. As soon as you introduce entanglement, it cannot visualize the state. That's why we are trying to use uh, a more general case. But for a single qubit, uh, the case is still similar. If you remember what Craig showed you. So in this circuit, I didn't do anything. So by default, Qiskit uh, initialize a qubit as state zero. So you see, this is like block sphere. You have a state zero with a probability of 100%. And at the bottom, you see the state one with zero probability. And you see the thickness of this line is representing the probability, uh, probability of this particular state. So it become very obvious in the next slide that when I'm trying to, sorry. I'm trying to show you a more interesting circuit that I added at X gate. And as I show you in the circuit composer, when you apply X gate, you flip the state of this qubit from zero to one. And you can see in this Q sphere that indeed the state become one with probability 100%. Next, we are going to create a superposition. To do that, you just need to do quantum circuit dot H and to put the number of the qubit, the index of qubit. But for this circuit, it's only one qubit, so the index is zero. And if you visualize it, you see the differences between Q sphere and the block sphere. You will see here the thickness of each line become half. So, which means that in this state, you have 50% of the chance being state zero and 50% of the chance being state one. So, this is the super precision. But as demonstrated in this uh, figure, the previously we are imagining that uh, we could actually see the super precision of the cat being dead or alive. But in reality, when we try to observe a certain quantum state, you can only see one of the chances. It's either death or alive. You've never seen a cat is dead or alive at the same time. So it's the same for our quantum circuits. So to actually understand what the state it is, we need to do measurement to find out the, the, the state in the quantum circuit. So to do that, you can just do measure, quantum circuit dot measure all. You will see that it added some classical register here and you read out the, do a measurement and read out and store the information to the classical, uh, classical bits. So I did here for the three circuit that we built just now for the state zero, state one, and the state plus, which is zero plus one. Sorry. And here we use a different simulator called Carlson simulator. Previously, we use a state vector simulator, which can give you the state vector, the final state of the quantum circuit. But this is not possible in the real devices. In the real devices, we need to uh, 
use, uh, we can only do one time measurement and you collapse the state and we can only see either zero or one and to see the whole statistic behavior of the quantum circuit, we need to do multiple executions. By default, our quantum circuit execute command give you 1024. Here, to simplify, we, I put the short to be 1000. So you see, for the first circuit, when the quantum state is zero, you see 100% or 1000 of the shorts are measured zero. And when for state one is 1000 or one, for the zero plus one state, we have close to 50% of zero and 50% of one. This can also be visualized in a histogram you see here. Okay. Before I dive into an entanglement, maybe let me check whether if there's any question. Is it everything all right? Yeah, everything's going good. Entangle away. Good. Okay. Yeah, your favorite entanglement. Okay. So as I mentioned in the when I try to demo in using the circuit composer, entanglement is a phenomenon of more than one qubit. So in here, before I introduce you the entanglement, we can expand the concept I, we learned about superposition to a two qubit circuit and see how it looks like in a Q sphere. So here I build a quantum circuit with two qubits and I apply Hadamard gates, which creates superposition in each of them. And you can see in the quantum circuit. And as I showed you before, just run it in state vector simulator and visualize it in a Q sphere. So you see that there's more two more dots here because now instead of only two states, we have two to the power of two, four states. And you also see that the line thickness of all these four states is the same because it's an equal supervision. And each of the state have a probability of 25%. So in this state, you see you can be Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one in an equal superposition, equal probability. So next I'm going to show you what is the difference when you generate a entanglement. So here I use a, the simplest example of an entangled state called Bell state, which I already show you in the circuit composer is zero, zero plus one, one. So in this circuit, I pull a Hadamard gate with a C0 gate. And you see the resulting state is no longer the superposition of four state, but only kind of like superposition between zero, zero and one, one. But this is not superposition because superposition is meaning for a single state that you can separate to. So in an entangled state, as the name suggests that this two qubit cannot be separate anymore because if you want to describe, if you ask me the question whether qubit zero is in zero or one, it actually depends on the second qubit. So whenever the first qubit is zero, the second qubit will become zero as well. And same when it is one, the second qubit also become one. So you see only these two possible outcome, zero, zero and one, one. It's not possible to be zero one or one zero. And we can also do that using the Kaosu simulator to mimic the behavior of actual devices. And indeed you see only about 50% of the chance we see zero zero and another 50% we see one one. So next concept is about quantum gates. You can see there is a whole array of uh, different quantum operations that we could do. I already show you the Hadamard gates and the X gate, and also these C naught gates. But we can also do other things that call Y gates or Z gates, or even more exotic ones that call uh, S gate, T gate, S dagger, T dagger. So if you want to read more about these different quantum gates operation, uh, you can see in this link. Later on, after the, my talk, I will share the link to my presentation so you can have a look to the link I link inside the presentation. Okay. Maybe we can have a look. 
let's see so if you follow this link you will see the documentation of IBM quantum experience you will see a nice visualization of the operation and what it does to the qubit in a block sphere rotation so you see in Hadamard gate it do a very strange rotation from zero to here in the equator which is a plus state if you go back to x state which is easier to understand you see it does what it does is it rotates the quantum state from a certain point usually zero and you rotate about the x-axis for 180 degrees so that's why it's called x if you do y gate you rotate 180 degree about the y axis of block sphere and z gate is rotate 180 degree about the z axis and so on so let me go So the last concept I want to cover is to demonstrate to you the interference concept and how it is being used in a quantum algorithm to provide you a quantum advantage over the classical computers. And this is uh, called Google algorithm. So first I'm going to show you how to do that in uh, the circuit composer of IBM quantum experience. So as so first, let me tell you about the problem. What is Grover's algorithm trying to solve? Maybe I can go back. Yeah, so Grover's algorithm is to do an unstructured search of a certain elements in a database. So you can think about a problem, for example, like you want to look for, you have a number of someone but you don't know which the, what is this number belonging to. So usually in a phone book, you can, you see the name and the phone number. The phone book is uh, indexed or uh, ordered by a certain order by the names. So it's easy to find a phone number of someone knowing the name, but the reverse problem is very difficult if you just know the number of the person and you want to find out who that person is because the phone book is not structured in the way that to order the whole number. So what Grover's algorithm is trying to do are uh, unstructured search, like you look for the number of a person in a phone book, and it provides a um, logarithmic uh, speed up over the best known classical algorithms. So to do that, you see, we I'm going to show you a simple example, which Greg already show you in the, his interference slide. We are going to do a three qubit Grover algorithm. So in a three qubit Grover algorithm, you have two about three, eight different states. So this is our tiny little database that we only have eight entries. And we are going to implement an Oracle that this Oracle is like, you can think about as a black box. It knows whether your answer is correct. So we can implement so the Oracle is saying, uh, for example, the zero one zero state is your right answer. Are you changing the slides? Because we're still on just that interference slide. Yeah, I'm still in here. Okay. So I'm trying to explain the basic concept before I go to the, go yeah. to the circuit. We just but had a question, you. no problem. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe that's a, yeah, a bit confusing if I don't show more of that. So that's the overall concept that you have a small database and we mark one of the entry as the correct answer. And then you're trying to, I'm trying to demonstrate to you that this corner algorithm can find the right answer in just two search. Well, if you have eight different things in a classical algorithm, you need to look at it one by one. Or if you're lucky, you look at half and then half and half, you are going to spend at least N over two. In this case, eight over two is four times. But I'm going to show you that in the quantum algorithm, you can spend only two query and you can find the right answer. So let's go back to the quantum circuit. So the growth algorithm is a very complicated circuit, as you can see here. 
but you, I can break it down. So the idea is that first you want to generate the equal supervision of all these qubits. And this part is the what I call the oracle. It knows which is the right answer of your of your search. And this part is to do some kind of reflection to increase and to do the interference and to increase the chances of the of getting the right answer. And here I'm doing two steps. You can see this is repeated. So when you do one step, the chances of getting the right answer is increased. When you do a second step, you will keep increasing. So in the IBM, uh, in the circuit composer, there's a very handy feature called inspect. And you can set um, different breakpoints so that we can have a idea of how it looks like after a certain block of expo uh, of quantum gates. So I'm setting the last step of each blocks. So let's see what it works. So you can see up to this point, we apply three different, uh, three Hadamard gates and you generate a equal supervision of these three qubits. You see all these eight different outcomes and they are equal probability. And after we run through this Oracle, you can see the color of this is changed, which the color denotes the phase, uh, the phase amplitude, the sign of the amplitude or the angle of the, the phase angle. And you see the state that we mark, which is the right answer, 0, 1, 0 is different. And if you go through this uh, called diffuser, you can already see the, the probability amplitude of the mark state is already increased. If you see the measurement outcome, you can see the probability already increased to 78%. If I go next step, I second iteration of this algorithm, you see again that the phase of this uh, right answer is different from all the rest. And if you do a diffuser again, you see this amplitude is enhanced yet again. And the measurement probability is increased from 78% in the first iteration to 94.5%. So it's almost certainty. And the nice thing about IBM quantum experience, of course, is not just that you can play around. All these things I've shown you until this point is all on the simulators. But what we can do is we can run a circuit, this circuit in a real devices. So we can see um, we have a quite a number of different devices. Some of them are open to everyone. Some are just for internal. So we can see uh, we can just prick anyone. And as I told you before that in the real devices, we need to do multiple uh, experiments to, to see, to get this probability. So by default is 1024, let's just do that. And let's run it. So you see we have here, already submitted a job to IBM QX2. And it's already running, so we are lucky. So in my in one, two minutes, you will show you the results. One thing you can also see is that uh, um, to be able to run the circuit on the actual devices, there's a few steps that need to happen. And this is all handled by Kiski code. So here is our ideal circuit, and we don't take into account of how the qubits are connected. Like Craig show you that the qubits are not all directly connected or coupled. And to do that, you need to swap certain case. For example, qubit zero and qubit two are not directly connected. And you want to do a C naught, you need to swap qubit one and qubit two in order to do that. And all this is handled by Qiskit and you what we call transpiling. It's a bit like compiling in the sense that you are in a classical programming language, like for example, Python, you don't need to handle uh, where I saw these uh, variables in a certain memory address. It's all handled in the lower level. And in Qiskit, you when you make a circuit, you can just think about ideal scenario 
and when you're doing translation you will take into account of the errors and the couplings between the qubits and you can convert this circuit to another circuit that can actually be run on the circuit and usually it will be much longer okay so it seems it takes a while to run but i can show you some result that i already showed you before oh actually it's done okay that's good so you see the results the zero one zero have the most but you can see that the percentage is not as high as what we expected like 94 percent that is because our quantum circuits are not perfect when we do a simulation like showing here we are simulating a perfect quantum computer it gives you a result of 94 percent but in the near-term devices we have a lot of errors and especially for a quantum circuit that is this is con considered really deep usually we do maybe a circuit that fits in one screen so you see the error making 010 become all the other states that's why you you don't see like the perfect matching of the simulation and experiment nevertheless you can still see that the state that we want to look for have still maximum so in in practice you can still know what is the right answer so we can still use these near-term devices to do something useful so that's what i want to show you in this demo and like before i can also show you how to run this in a code so um oh, sorry there's a very neat feature in the quantum uh, circuit composer so here is a very simple way of just doing check and drop right but maybe you want to do some more fancy thing in the code and it's very easy to copy this circuit you can see on the left there's a like this code part which is uh, the assembly quantum assembly language of this quantum circuit you see it apply Hallman gate but it's not the same as Qiskit but we can copy the whole string and put into a Python code a string and you store all this information in one string and using this quantum circuit dot from calcium string quantum assembly you create this exact same circuit in the Python environment alternatively you can also create a whole circuit using code from ground up you can create I make a function for grow algorithm which does exactly what I show you in the second poster you can see first we do Hadamard gates and we see here it has an iteration that first we do the Oracle and then diffuser and if the iteration is two we would repeat this and at the end we measure these are just a subroutine of this algorithm and this is some code to try to visualize the state snapshot in the thing because in Kiski it doesn't have the nice feature I show you in Kis uh, the second composer to inspect the quantum state in each point but I use a function to try to do similar things that at this we call barrier we can try to have a snapshot of the quantum state at these points so we created this circuit and we can run it in the state vector simulator and also visualize in the Q sphere then you can have a more visual way of see how this uh, algorithm works and how the interference is coming to work so at the first point we are after all applying all the Hadama gates you see in this three qubit growth algorithm you have equal superposition of these eight different states we have zero 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 here and one 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 here and the other is in around the equator and here is the measurement statistics so it's all equal this is the uh, state vector amplitude sorry so if you do a square root uh, do a square you will get the uh, amplitude the probability and after applying the oracle you see one of these state which is the state that we want to look for the phase already changed the as uh, shown by the color 
and only this one is changed. The rest, they are not the right answer. They don't have the phase change. And after the next step, which is called diffuser or reflection, you see the amplitude already enhanced to 78%. And if you repeat it again, you see this color is different from all the others because the phase is different. So after the second iteration, the probability already increased to 95%. So this is just a glimpse of how a quantum algorithm might work in the circuit composer, as well as the how you write in a Python code using Giski. And if you want to learn more, I also included more learning resources here. And last week, to celebrate the fourth anniversary of the IBM Quantum Experience, we did an online hackathon. We provided four quantum programming exercises to be solved in four days. And there was overwhelming responses from over the internet. We have 1,745 participants coming from 45 different countries. And during these 96 hours of the challenge, on our IBM Quantum Experience, we have exceeded over 1 billion quantum circuit run in every single day of these four days. So that was a remarkable and historic achievement. And if you want to learn more, you can watch this, uh, you can follow this link. You can watch our coding with Kiskit YouTube series. Or you can also read the Get Started with IBM Quantum Experience, the documentation of IBM Quantum Experience. And if you want to learn more the rigorous way, like uh, how a university will teach you in a quantum building, you can also follow our uh, this link to our open source Kiski textbook. And recently, because of the COVID-19 situation, we cannot have more uh, physical events. But the good thing is that we are bringing many more online contents on our YouTube channel. So if you go to Kiski YouTube, we have a uh, regular session of Kiski Live on every Wednesday and every Friday. And in this Kiski Live, our researchers and our developers shows you how to, uh, how to, it's like what I'm doing now using a demo, but a more deep dive in certain functions of Kiski. And you can also follow Twitter and, or join our Kiski Slack. We have a very active uh, community. And as I mentioned to you, we have the IBM Connect uh, Challenge last week. And if you want to try the questions, you can find out the questions in this link, which is a GitHub repository of all the questions. You can try that out. So as promised you that I'm going to show you the quantum pong. This is a game that I made in the first uh, Kiskit camp, a hackathon organized by the Kiskit community team before I joined Kiskit as a, IB, as a IBM employee. Uh, so to start that, I need to change the screen sharing features. Maybe before that, let me see if there's any questions. Okay. In the, the chat, the guys have been sharing the links in the chat with everyone. Maybe. Yeah. Simon Wei is our very active uh, Kiskit advocate. So, <laughs> yeah, he knows all the links. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, is there any questions for me? Seems there's no question, right? Just about the slide. All right. Uh, so we still have about 10 minutes left. Just let me uh, show you the game that I promised to show you. Okay. First, I need to change my screen sharing session options. Okay, now you should be able to see my whole screen. I'm going to launch the game. It's taking some time. So as the name suggests, uh, Q-Pong is the quantum version of the very classic video game Pong. I guess most of you have played this uh, or heard of Pong before. So this game, as I mentioned, was made in a hackathon with my teammates, so at the bottom. 
and we can choose the difficulty level. So let's just go as normal. So if you go enter this game, you see this interface. There on the left is a classical computer, just a, a computer AI. On the right hand side is a quantum computer that is controlled by the circuit composer, very much like the circuit composer on IBM quantum experience. And you can see now its circuit is empty. And so that the, the state is zero, 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 and the pedal, oh, sorry, or loss. So um, the pedal position is determined by the quantum state of the quantum circuit. So if I pull a X here, you see that it becomes zero, zero, one, because the first qubit is still from zero to one. And if I do a Hadamard gate,